Hey everybody, uh, the, for some reason the broadcast didn't go through today, so I thought I'd, I'd do a quick uh, redo on the message. Um, it was a message about building uh, community, and uh, it came from that passage in Acts about um, just how they were a thriving community um, based on grace. And uh, so I wanted to dedicate this, uh, this speech to the, uh, the people uh, who showed me what a community of grace looks like down in Mexico. And I um, just posted a, a video of what that, to them in Spanish. Um, so this is kind of what I said today in, in English. And um, uh, this week I got to thinking about this because um, I had to give a speech at West High, kind of commemorating the 50th year anniversary of West High. And I was talking to parents, administrators, and students uh, in the library where um, we have these big murals behind that were behind me. And I was, I thought, I've got to figure out what the essence of West High is. Um, and uh, so I used the murals that were behind me. And uh, I told the story that, I mean, I think kind of is a common knowledge thing for a lot of people who are familiar with West, but uh, the murals were painted by a guy named Chuck Raymond who unfortunately um, had a, a drinking problem and uh, supposedly he'd go get down off the scaffold, go out to the li uh, parking lot and have a few shots of alcohol and then come back and, and paint. And uh, what I think it is remarkable is how many communities would probably let him go uh, because of something like that. And, uh, and so I was, I was, the West didn't let him go. I, I think because they saw that he had some beauty in him. And uh, in other words, you don't have to have everything together to be a part of that, the West High community, that hopefully we see beauty in you and, and you get to express it and share it with us. And, uh, and I thought that really kind of captured the heart of West. Um, and uh, it got me thinking about this passage um, in Acts uh, today, and, and that there's really kind of two types of communities. Um, there's there's a community of grace, and there's communities of merit. And and you would think that that a school would be a community of merit. People have to earn their grades, earn their scholarships, and things like that. But that's not the kind of stuff that sticks. That's not the kind of stories people want to hear uh, fifty years uh, later. They want to hear stories of grace. That's what moves people. Um, it's grace. And uh, um, so I was going to jump ahead in the reading because at the end of the reading in Acts today, it says that the Lord added to their number daily. Now, how did that community grow? It grew by like 3,000 people a day or something like that. It was crazy. Um, it grew because of the culture they made. People are drawn to grace and unconditional love. You know, I see articles on the, about Christianity on the verge of extinction. And, and I think a lot of people's solution to it is, hey, let's build a coffee bar. Let's, let's, let's get some high tech televisions in here. or Let's get a rock band or something like that. And no, no offense. If you've got a rock band in the church, that's awesome. Great. But gimmicks don't transform people's lives. But grace can. You know, research says that effective communities are the ones that always focus on culture and climate. It's not the places that focus on test scores or winning games or profit or the number of active members. It's the places that build cultures of grace connection, belonging. Those are the ones that thrive. You know, the, the community in Acts is, is thriving. It doesn't just like believe in resurrection. It is a resurrection in its society. And, you know, we've been so conditioned by our, our culture uh, that it's difficult to grasp the, the radical nature of this message. It says this, they were devoted to learning 
fellowship, prayer, daily breaking bread in each other's homes. They were filled with awe and wonder. They pooled their resources and shared with those in need. Notice it doesn't say that they shared with those who deserved it or earned it or had some sort of transactional benefit for them. They just helped those in need. Sometimes I think nothing makes Americans more angry than someone getting something for nothing. And the funny thing is that we're all getting something for nothing. The universe is a grace-based system. It's not a meritocracy. For example, the sun today. Did, did you or I do anything to make that thing shine? Because without it, nothing exists. How about, did you do anything or did I do anything this morning to, to get that atmosphere to trap that oxygen in so that you and I could breathe? Did, did we do anything to get our parents to love us when we were born? Did, did, when we woke up today, did we do something to our eyes to earn that sight that we have? We just have it. It's free. It's crazy. And it's really the, it's the big things in life that, that matter. And, uh, and I think that when we understand that, we walk more humbly. Now, money, we're in a very money, money centric culture. Um, and now granted with money, it is a little different, but we do earn our money. Um, you know, we work hard, we get a paycheck. That's, that's good. That's the way the system works. The problem comes when we ascribe value to human beings based on their money. And if we're honest, I think this country strongly believes that Elon Musk and Bill Gates are more valuable human beings than the people at the warming shelter here in Sioux City. Now, that's not the way God does it. God values people because they're people. God goes by grace, not merit. And this meritocracy stuff, I think, has big consequences for us. And I believe one of the root problems we have in our, our country today is that uh, it has to do with this notion that people, people's value is, is related to their material wealth. And that poses a problem for those, that, that, excuse me, that poses no problem for people who have wealth. But for the growing number of people who are working two to three essential jobs and still not making it, to them, this is abusive idea. Because if our, if our value as a person depends on our income and our income is low, well, then that means our value as a human being is low. And that's a terrible idea. And for a lot of people, I think the social contract has been broken. The contract said that if you work hard, you'll get ahead. But there are too many people working two jobs and barely getting by. And they're angry about the betrayal of our most cherished value. And this is dangerous. This is a pressure cooker in our society. And in, in many instances in world history, this has led to violence. So Jesus takes this meritocracy problem and, and this attitude that people might not say, but poor people internalize and say, well, I must be somehow less because I make less money. And Jesus takes that and, and, and really has a totally different uh, angle on that thing. His, his angle is grace, not merit. And I think that it's hard for people to kind of believe that this story in Acts is actually true. But I, I had a chance in my life to, to see that these kind of communities actually they exist today in today's world and uh it's and i and i was lucky enough to, to stumble across uh, a community like this and i and i showed up in 1996 you know, it was unannounced i i had ready used clothes from the goodwill i had an old 600 hundred dollar car i had long hair no job i mean i was perfectly suspicious Probably some sort of freeloading loser, right? And what happened next in my life would, would really change my life. Because I knocked on that door and a guy named Father John opened the door, invited me in and took me upstairs. And he said something that changed my life. He said, here's your room. 
stay as long as you want. Supper's at six. And, you know, that's, today I consider that that's the gospel. Um, the gospel according to John. And I was like, you guys don't even know me. I, I don't even speak Spanish. I mean, I, I don't even know if I believe in God. I'm not a Catholic. And what, 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 do I, what do I possibly have to offer you guys? I have nothing. And in the midst of my life, you know, crisis, what can I bring to you? You know, the world doesn't have places for people who study religion and then don't believe in it anymore. But these people at the Casa gave me a place. I didn't bring any money. You know, and I, so I just, I, I was, I was floored by this. Like, why would you take me in? What's wrong with you people? Where's your background checks, your resume? Where's, you never asked me about my background in education or anything. None of it mattered. Father John was just like, Hey, cool. You're here. Welcome. <laughs> it's like, it's unbelievable. I mean, it's unbelievable. And, and it wasn't like welcome, like a word welcome. It was like a place welcome. It was like a brotherhood welcome. It was like a roof welcome. It was like a food welcome. You know, like like Wes did with that Chuck Raymond, the, the artist. It was like, brother, bring the sum total of who you are in here, and we'll accept you and celebrate it. In a real way, I think that's really what the gospel is. So anyway, I went down to supper that night at six o'clock, and and uh, over the course of a couple of years, I I would I would meet amazing people at that dinner table, and one of the people I met had uh, had met Mother Teresa of Calcutta, and uh, he would say something that would shape the rest of my life, but I I'll, I'll get to that in a sec. But the table was just vibrant, lively conversations, laughter, so engaging, and um, but then the next morning. I had to go out into the neighborhood, and that neighborhood was not so bilingual, and I was I was linguistically paralyzed out there. And I ended up working in a wood shop with a guy named Chuy Morales, who I swear spoke the fastest Spanish in the history of Spanish. Um, and we made free coffins for families that couldn't afford coffins. And uh, there was a boy there named Noé uh, who made me a pencil holder, which I don't have in front of me right now, but... Um, the kids really had the patience and really were taught me a ton of Spanish. Uh, <laughs> but it was difficult and slow. And I ended up doing like soup kitchen work, uh, delivery of food. I taught English. I taught literacy. I was basically having the time of my life. But I should add that I was making $50 a month uh, while I was doing all that. And, that, and it, even by... Mexican standards, that's off the chart poor. That's, that's not even, you, they, that was crazy poor. And, but I had a home and I had a roof and a food, but, but you know, it wasn't much money. And people back here were saying, what is he thinking? What, what is he doing with his life? What they didn't understand is that I had something so much bigger than money. I had community, connection, belonging. And uh, I had a cause. And I shared that cause with other people who also believed in that cause. And uh, we devoted ourselves to this. Learning. Fellowship. Breaking bread. Prayer. We were a community filled with awe and wonder. Laughter. And we pooled our resources and shared with those in need. And it wasn't a fairy tale. Um, we actually lived this act stuff out, if you can believe that. And anyway, though... While I was having the time of my life, I still suffered substantial shame when I came back to Sioux City. I was 29 years old. I was driving a $600 car, which sort of worked. I didn't have health insurance. And everywhere I looked in the United States, I was reminded of how big of a failure I was because I was not financially stable. And, and this culture will etch that stuff into your bones. That you are not valuable. You earn less, so you are less. And it was a shock to go from a grace-based system at the Casa over here uh, to Sioux City, where it's a merit-based system. Anyway, now after years, uh, many years, I am financially stable. Um, 
But I'll tell you the truth that, you know, I'll, I'll hold for the rest of my life. And that you can be richer making $50 a month within a grace-based community than you can making thousands of times more than that in a merit-based community. And I don't want to brag, but I feel like I was extremely rich making $50 a month. I worked with two guys, uh, Don Maximo and El Piteco, and, and both of them were in wheelchairs. And uh, I helped feed El Piteco, and I, I taught Don Maximo how to read and write. You see, the, the real wealth was being a part of a community of, of love and grace. And they could have so easily doubted me. I didn't look impressive. You know, I didn't have any credentials, didn't speak any Spanish, didn't have anything to offer them. But that's not how the gospel works. The good news of Jesus sounds like this. Here's your room. Stay as long as you want. Suffers at six. And when you get grace like that, you don't need coffee bars and rock bands and stuff. Remember Chuck Raymond at the beginning of this? Well, the guy who shared the gospel with me, Father John, who invited me into that room, and he also had some struggles, I believe, um, with alcohol. And, you know, what's kind of crazy is that the grace-based community at the Casa took in Father John the same way Father John took me in. We don't earn our way into the finest riches of life. The finest riches in life, I think, belong, is like belonging to a community and that loves us just because of who we are, just, just because we are who we are. And these kind of riches really aren't earned. They're freely given away, the way that the Casa loved Father John, even though he had some, some issues, the way Father John loved me, even though I had some issues. And that leads me back to that table and the guy I met who had met Mother Teresa. And he sensed that, that community of grace with her. And in the buzz of all that, he said, you know, Mother Teresa, what, what should I do? What should I do with Mother Teresa? And she said, build a community like this where you live. And since that conversation in 1997 with that guy at the table, I've always known for sure that my calling in my life is to build a Casa Franciscana where I am. And for years I moped around Sioux City saying, well, I can't find a community like the one I did at the Casa Franciscana. And, and then it dawned on me, my job is not to find one, it's to build one. Build a community of grace right here where I am. We have all kinds of resources at First Congregational. You know, it's not about how cool our worship service is. It's not about how, how flashy our website is. It's not about how many people we can bring in. The focus is to be, be like that community in Acts. Meet daily. I mean, we're a weekly operation. How do we meet daily? I don't know. But meet daily for fellowship, daily bread, prayer, work for the good of others, those kind of things. Which, we, you know, so we're doing. We had breakfast today. That's awesome. We're eating together. We, we're giving away food to the the homeless shelter and the soup kitchen all the time. That, that that's, that's awesome stuff. But when that's, when that stuff happens, when unconditional acceptance and unmerited love are the focus, then real wealth starts to accrue and a broken world sees that. And I just pray um, to close this. Dear God, please help us to be that community of grace in our community. Amen.